Well, hello everyone, and thank you so much for joining us this evening. My name is Moira Flood, and I am the Alumni Engagement Manager here at Alverno. Um, I have the pleasure of being joined this evening by Dr. Maureen Helwig, <coughs> excuse me, um, who is here to discuss her recently released book, A Neighbor Among Neighbors. Um, so I will go ahead and turn it on over to you, Maureen. Well, thank you. I really appreciate um, being invited um, to speak to the Alverno alums and uh, classmates of mine, class of 68. <laughs> Gosh, that's a long time ago already. Yeah. Uh, <laughs> but um, I always tell people, and I said so in the beginning of my book, of how important um, my education at Alverno was. And um, in general, with the, I had the School Sisters of St. Francis all my life, from grade school to high school to college. So um, what you see today <laughs> is a product of that. And I just knocked my phone off. Oh, all right, let me pick that up. So um, I um, hope that you'll enjoy this. It, it takes about a half hour to go through the slides and the presentation, and then I'll be happy to answer uh, any questions that you might have uh, at the end of the presentation, okay? Sounds good. Okay, here we go. And sorry, I forgot to change the first slide. I looked at all the photos again. <laughs> it should say <laughs> presentation to Alverno alums, but anyway. Just to let you know, this is not my first time, so uh, we'll, we'll go from there. So let me begin. Um, <clears throat> I'm happy really to be here this evening to share a Chicago story. Uh, the birth and growth of the Settlement House movement before, during, and after Hull House and Jane Addams. <clears throat> my view is that it was a faith-based movement, not necessarily church-based, although churches were involved nor was it religious, but rather as Eleanor De uh, Stebner describes in her book, The Women of Hull House, it was a study in spirituality, vocation, and friendship. <clears throat> the leader of this movement was Jane Addams, and it started on Halstead Street here in Chicago in 1989 at a place called Hull House. However, as a deep admirer of Jane and aware of the many books written by and about her, I felt it was time for the story of a place that was influenced by her and has actually surpassed Hull House in its longevity. And this is the story of Erie Neighborhood House that started on Erie Street, just Northwest of downtown and was doing some of Jane's work 19 years before she came on the scene, welcoming immigrants and starting them on their path to success not by denigrating their foreign culture, but by celebrating it. The work was started by a small mission church called Holland Presbyterian in 1870, when Ulysses Grant was still president and the city was only 33 years old. It first embraced the children of the neighborhood in what was described as the largest Sunday school in Chicago at that time. <clears throat> but the church laymen like Thomas Templeton soon realized that their mission needed to extend beyond religious teachings. And so the Erie Chapel Institute, as you see on the sign here, um, <clears throat> was incorporated in 1915. Here you see uh, the many children Erie worked with, first in Sunday school, then in kindergarten, which in those days was not part of the public school. Uh, and eventually in subsidized childcare, which is still their largest program today. Then Erie Neighborhood House was adopted as its name in 1936, when the current structure at 1347 Erie was built on the same site as the ECI. Go to the next slide, please. And just half a block from where the church used to stand. So that's what you'll see today, uh, standing at that location since 1936. Um, <clears throat> So for the 150 years since Holland Presbyterian Church, it responded to five generations of immigrants that passed through its doors at roughly the same address for those 150 years, giving it a unique perspective on this port of entry neighborhood. So who were the five generations of immigrants uh, and neighbors? First, it was the Dutch and Norwegian immigrants among the earliest arrivals in the new city of Chicago in the 1830s and 40s. They were generally not Presbyterians, but no matter. As these two groups prospered, they moved on, 
Norwegians stayed the closest as they generally moved next door to West Town, settling in Humboldt Park or Logan Square. Norwegian American Hospital, where I was born, by the way, uh, was part of their legacy. And only recently, after 125 years, a name change was announced by CEO Jose Sanchez, calling it now Humboldt Park Health, basically a Latino serving hospital today. From the 1880s through the 1920s, the Dutch and Norwegians were replaced by Poles and Italians, or at least people who traced their origins to what is now called Italy. It did not exist uh, when they first arrived in America. Next slide, please. <clears throat> Here you see the Ganella bread wagon, uh, an example of one of the successful businesses started by Italian immigrants. You may well have had Ganella bread with your pasta, uh, if you uh, eat at a local Italian restaurant, as canela bread is still in existence today. And in this slide, we see a picture of a woman we called Mom Savino. She first came to Erie House when it was still the Erie Chapel Institute in the 1920s. She and her husband, Dominic, uh, both got jobs at Erie, but also volunteered for many hours beyond uh, their work time. I had the opportunity to meet her in person in the late 1960s, and by then she was already an eerie institution for more than 50 years. For the most part, these Italians were Catholics, as were the Poles, who also came to Erie, followed by immigrants from Latin America. Eventually, there were more Poles in Chicago than in Warsaw. Uh, on the next slide, you'll see one of the first churches that they built um, called uh, St. Stanislaus Kaska, located about eight blocks uh, north of Erie House. The church, as you see it on the left there, still stands, minus one tower, but the school building next to it was replaced with a more modern structure in the 1950s. <clears throat> Puerto Ricans started arriving in the 1950s. <clears throat> and were among the first immigrants to fly to their new home as Pan American established, and this I guess is actually Eastern also, had very cheap flights from San Juan to Chicago. And so that's how a number of Puerto Ricans arrived in Chicago. Um, they're getting off a plane at Midway Airport before there even was an O'Hare. Um, <clears throat> the first Puerto Ricans settled in the south end of Lincoln Park. This is the neighborhood where former Congressman Luis Gutierrez lived until his parents decided to move back to Puerto Rico when he was about 15. He returned to Chicago as an adult and by then settled himself and his wife in the west end of West Town, the successor to Lincoln Park for Chicago's Puerto Rican community. The Gutierrez family was a good example of what Gina Perez has called the va y ven, go and come pattern of Puerto Rican migration in her book, The Northwest Side Story. Mexicans like Virginia Moreno, who I knew when I worked at Erie, were already in the neighborhood and connecting to Erie House by the 1970s. Next slide. But the floodgates opened for Mexican immigrants following the amnesty order issued by President Ronald Reagan, of all people, in 1986. While it was called the Immigration Reform and Control Act, the result was just the opposite of control. The plan was to grant legal status to the undocumented who had already flowed into the US with the understanding that no more Mexicans would come without papers. Instead, by 2000, there were more Mexicans living in Chicago and Cook County than in Houston and San Antonio, Texas. Mexican immigration to Chicago eventually surpassed the previous record-breaking Polish immigration I already mentioned. And here's a photo of some uh, Mexican immigrants uh, in uh, their English class. And please don't ever let anyone tell you that immigrants don't want to learn English. Erie had classes Monday through Thursday evenings and twice on Saturday, and the classes were all full. Those who could not get to a class signed up for a free tutor with Susanna Ortiz, who has been running that program for more than 25 years. As all of this was transpiring, except for the very earliest days, it was never about making new Presbyterians at Erie House, but about making new neighbors. Not necessarily in the sense of geographic proximity, but in the sense of neighbor that one found in the gospel, 
especially the social gospel, that called for neighboring with the most marginalized and the poorest of the poor. As the leadership of Erie became aware of Jane Addams' work, they recognized it and modeled it, but the foundation of the house had been laid years earlier. No doubt a critical factor in the longevity of Erie House, even surpassing Hull House, led me to build the bulk of the narrative in my book around it. As in real estate, the mantra is location, location, location. The core of the Erie story is leadership, leadership, leadership. Following the introductory chapters of my book, the rest are titled with the name of the head resident or executive director at the helm since 1926, making these leaders pretty much responsible for 100 of the 150 years of Erie's work. It was in 1926 that Miss Florence Town shifted into the role of head resident from her job as kindergarten teacher and director of girls work that she had been doing since 1914. She stayed in the head resident role until her death in 1951. She was indeed a resident as she lived on the property belonging to ECI and then on the third floor of the new house when it opened in 1936. She was succeeded by Ross Lyman, who I will say more about shortly. He was a Presbyterian minister. <clears throat> and then um, from left to right here are um, almost all the other directors except the current one who wasn't in the picture. So on the left, Ricardo Estrada, Mary uh, <clears throat> Steinberg X, Solana Roldan, Rafael Rivello, and Esther Nieves. Ricardo is Mexican. Uh, Mary X is Jewish, Selena Roldan, Puerto Rican, Rafael Ravello, Cuban, and Esther Nieves, Puerto Rican. So you can see the diversity of leadership over time. Now, let me just share three stories of this organization's impactful work. Uh, story number one, how Erie addressed racial equity in the 1940s, a timely topic today, certainly. Before Florence Town became resident, there was a long line of ministers whose direct service culminated with the term of Reverend Ross Lyman from 1952 until 1977. And church services continued until 1968 at Erie in what was known as the chapel on the second floor of the east wing of the structure built in 36. But few of those names of ministers are well remembered for some outstanding contribution. As the years went by and ministers came and went, Miss Florence was clearly the leader acknowledged by the residents. As one participant who did attend services at the chapel noted, at the end of the Sunday service, two lines formed at the rear of the chapel, one to the minister and one to Miss Florence. Hers was always longer. But inspired when he heard Miss Florence speak at North Park Seminary here in Chicago, the Reverend Doug Cedarleaf would be an exception to the rule. <clears throat> he came to Erie in the early 1940s, but his day in history came on February 18, 1945. He and Miss Town heard <clears throat> about how one of the first black families that had moved into the Erie neighborhood, John Strong's family, had been threatened with rocks through their windows in an effort to get them to move out. With the Strong family in the pews, his sermon that Sunday uh, was titled Vandalism on Thrift Street. As he passionately confronted the racially motivated violence directed at the Strong family, he called upon the members of the congregation to love their neighbors as themselves. Then he invited them to get up and show that love by escorting the family home. <clears throat> as they walked to Throop Street, obviously here they're standing in front of Erie first. Um, as they walked to Throop Street, um, perhaps 50, 60 in number, they sang Lift Every Voice and Sing, which was later to become an anthem of the civil rights movement. It's a lovely hymn if you've never heard it. Um, they carried signs that said, Christianity means love your neighbor and signs that said democracy means liberty and justice for all. The next day, they were on the front page of the Chicago Tribune. This all transpired 10 years before Rosa Parks refused to move to the back of the bus on December 1st, 1955. From 1945 to the present, Black Lives Mattered at Erie House right along with the immigrants. 
Story number two. In 1957, Carmela Genova Jacob, an Erie House participant and a cancer patient of Dr. Snyder, shared with him her love for Erie House, the good work it was doing, and what she noticed as a volunteer and neighbor as a lack of access to good health care. With Dr. Snyder's help, and that's him on the left, um, and Erie's capacity and sense of mission, the idea of a free clinic was born in 1957. You see Reverend Lyman on the right and seated is, is Reverend Ben Richardson, who was assistant director uh, under with Ross. Eventually, medical residents from Northwestern Medical School interned at the clinic and learned to understand and value community-based medical practice. Nurses joined the doctors <clears throat> and eventually, um, let's see, nurses joined the doctors and eventually the concept of nurse practitioners emerged as the primary mode of uh, service at the Erie Clinic. Um, for just about 30 years, the clinic popped up in a few back rooms at Erie House by maybe two evenings a week, and then tucked itself away to return the space to other Erie programs during the day. It was Sally Lundeen, a pioneer nurse practitioner, that was instrumental in moving the clinic out of Erie House to its own space in 1985, but only a few blocks away, staying committed to the same neighborhood. For the 30 years before that, the Erie Board and Executive Director Ross Lyman and Mary X remained committed to the clinic, providing free space and financial subsidies, while Erie participants and neighbors volunteered at the front desk to make sure clinic participants felt welcome and trusting of the health care they would receive through their neighbor. Meanwhile, Presbyterian Church volunteers helped by launching Meals on Wheels to bring meals to the elderly and other shut-ins who the clinic identified as undernourished. This pioneer home visiting program continued at Erie for the next 30 plus years when it was turned over to the city's Department of Aging in the 1990s. Today, the clinic once again shares a building with Erie House at 1701 West Superior, a building they acquired together in 1995. Erie House occupies floors one and two with their child care program primarily, and the clinic occupies uh, floors three and four. While this became uh, the headquarters for what was now called Erie Family Health Center, it grew under the leadership of Dr. Lee Francis to open 12 other sites in the metro area and celebrated its 60th year of service in 2017 as the largest network of healthcare services for the poor in the Chicago metro area. Story number three, from affordable healthcare to affordable housing, the founding of the Bickerdike Redevelopment Corporation. 10 years after the clinic was launched in 1967, still under the leadership of Ross Lyman, Erie House collaborated with the Northwest Community Organization, better known as NCO, and Holy Innocence Church to launch a nonprofit community-based organization to develop affordable housing options for local residents. Since the private marketplace failed to develop new housing, partly as a result of redlining and partly from lack of faith that anyone would buy a house anywhere in Westtown, these three organizations took up the challenge to prove them wrong. They called their new initiative Bickerdike Redevelopment Corporation, and once again, Erie stepped up to offer free space and help pay the salaries of initial hires. Eventually, Bickerdike figured out how to build housing and still maintain affordability in this hostile environment for two reasons. First, community organizing fully and financially supported by Erie House, kept the pressure on local banks to stop redlining and make mortgages available locally. Thus, Bickard Ike secured its first mortgage in 1968, the year I graduated. But if NCO had not come into being in 1962, it is doubtful there would have even been the opportunity to have a Bickard Ike. Together, Catholic churches and Protestant settlement houses took Saul Alinsky's model for community-based control over a neighborhood's future 
and used it to keep the wrecking ball of urban renewal away from West Town in the 1960s and again in the 1970s when the Chicago 21 plan again threatened to tear down the Erie neighborhood. Among the Protestant based settlement houses active with NCO, Erie House was preeminent. And there you see Reverend Lyman uh, standing at a microphone at what was called the NCO Congress. This was an annual membership meeting to set the next year's agenda. Uh, in NCO's first year, Reverend Lyman was the master of ceremonies. So you see how these two organizations were linked. On the Catholic Church side, Holy Innocence, just two blocks from Erie House, was home to two consecutive activist pastors. Father Tony Janiak, there he is at an NCO Congress, um, shared uh, the NCO co-founding co honors uh, with Reverend Lyman. Following Father Janiak, uh, Father Edward Pajak kept Holy Innocence uh, Parish engaged in the fight for affordable housing and the founding of Bickerdike. The other major representation from the Catholic Church, both with NCO and Erie House, was provided by the School Sisters of St. Francis, the Order of Women uh, <clears throat> who founded Alverno College. From the Second Vatican Council forward, women in religious orders were characterized by a popular book at that time called The Nun in the World. No one took that more seriously than the sisters at Santa Maria Adolorada, who taught at the parish school located on the next street right behind Erie House. Their leader was the school principal, Sister Antonelda, as you see her here, uh, pictured speaking at an NCO community meeting. Sisters served on the boards of both Erie House and NCO. The sisters' mission, teach the children during the day, show up at community meetings at night to fight for their children's neighborhood. And in the next slide, here she is coming out of the mayor's office. You see her uh, habit has now changed, been updated, so to speak. And now Sister Ancinelda was Sister Marion. Um, what had not changed was the mayor. It was still Richard J. Daly. While community org organizing saved the neighborhood, the second part of Bickerdike's success was through, came through government programs. To make those mortgages more affordable, Bickerdike was able to use Section 235 of the National Housing Act of 1968 that made federally subsidized home mortgages available. Previously, these subsidies had only been available in the suburbs. And when you think about it, this explains why residential growth in the suburbs was huge following World War II and why the city um, was held back for a long time without having these uh, affordable mortgages available. Um, <clears throat> so here we see um, uh, groundbreaking for one of those 235 homes. On the left is Father Pajak, pastor of Holy Innocence. Next is Juan Sierra, a Puerto Rican activist with NCO and John Jack Irving, whose kids went to Santa Maria School. Uh, the next two guys must be from uh, the local bank or something. And then on the far right with his head bowed is uh, Reverend Lyman from Erie House. Groundbreakings like this became a frequent occurrence. And this is an example of one of the first houses built. Now you might say that kind of looks like it belongs in the burbs. Unfortunately, the architectural designs at the time uh, kind of looked like this, but that didn't bother. In fact, people were thrilled to be able to buy a house like this and stay in the neighborhood they liked and with the church that they belonged to. This was house was built in the 1400 block of West Erie, just a block west of Erie House. Eventually, Bickerdike built and sold a little over a hundred of these section 235 homes. Following that success, it was apparent that rental housing was also needed for lower income residents that could not even afford a 235 house and or were not really ready to become homeowners. Another federal program <clears throat> would help here as Bickerdike took up the task of developing Section 8 housing with subsidies to keep the rents affordable. And this is one of the first clusters of that Section 8 housing built on Huron Street, just one block north of of Erie House. So you can see Erie's early involvement in these organizations meant that a lot of the developments happened close to Erie House itself. 
Um, after the success of, of that program, um, Bickerdike moved on to rehab existing apartment buildings and offer updated apartments to holders of what were called Section 8 certificates. As Bickerdike marked its 50th anniversary in 2017, it owned and managed hundreds of units of quality affordable housing and has not stopped developing more. The latest being a transit oriented development of rental housing in Logan Square. For about the last 25 of its 50 years, it's had its office at 2550 West North Avenue. And for the last 25 years, it's been under the leadership of a Cuban woman by the name of Joy Aruguete. So we have a 60 year old clinic, a 50 year old housing development organization. You might say that Erie House built things to last. And these are just three of many of the stories that are told in my book, A Neighbor Among Neighbors. There it is. Uh, it's available through our publisher, MIPJ.org, through Amazon or IndieBound, if you prefer to support independent bookstores and or can be downloaded at Kindle. And please note that half of the proceeds from the sales of, sale of the book go to Erie House. Thank you so much for your attention. And uh, if you I have any questions, I would uh, love to answer them or try to. Thank you. Thank you so much, Maureen. That was really wonderful. Um, just so everybody knows during the presentation, I put you on mute. Um, so if you have a question, you'll have to unmute yourself first. I have a question. I live up in Skokie Evanston and we have an Erie Family Health Center that's Skokie and Evanston. Yep. Is that an off from Erie Family Health Center? Same one. Uh, yep. They have clinics I, all the way up to Waukegan. Yeah, and, I thought uh, it, but I wasn't sure. Thank you. Yeah, mm -hmm. in fact, probably Erie Family Health Center is better known than Erie House because they have 13 sites, you know, from the headquarters plus 12 others. So a lot of people encounter. And I'll, if I say, you know, I worked at Erie House, oh, yeah, the health center. Well, yeah, <laughs> we, we started the health center, but uh, it's it's a separate organization. Yeah, mm -hmm. one thing I enjoyed with them is my Rotary <clears throat> had a program over there. And our giveaway, you know, in addition to money, was that they asked us to bring a book to give to their physicians because they would use the book in their evaluation of young children if you know they're one or two. Mm -hmm. Them the book and if they threw it away, they knew they'd never saw a book before. Yeah. <laughs> and they'd love to take the book home. And I, I just thought that was such a wonderful program. Yeah. Mm -hmm. I have a question. Uh, in the early years <laughs> of uh, Erie House, did the uh, immigrants have to pay? I mean, was there a tuition or what? No, or throughout the uh, whole history of uh, Erie House. Um, in later years, in the early days, nobody nobody paid. Um, in later years, there were sometimes fees for some programs. Um, but I remember like, you know, English class might be $25 for the whole semester. And if you took it at one of the local colleges, it would be a lot more than that. So um, it was usually more or less just a little money to help um, with materials that the teacher wanted to use in the class. But uh, mm -hmm. Most programs at Erie are free. Now, childcare is subsidized. Families <laughs> do pay part of the cost of childcare based on a sliding scale according to their income. Um, but again, the families paying the most are still probably half of what the market rate is for, mm -hmm. for childcare if they did it in the private <laughs> sector. Mm -hmm. oh. Yeah, the government really required that um, the idea is that they set up a match so that families feel know they have to pay something mm -hmm. yeah. and then they are matched by the federal subsidies, federal and state. Mm -hmm. Yeah, Erie has even today. Also said this to uh, uh, Maureen before, I, I read the book and it's more like reading a history of Chicago. Mm -hmm. It really is fascinating. Yeah. Um, you can uh, see all, how, how all the neighborhoods would uh, develop. And it's, uh, yeah, I tried to do that to really put it in the context because you know if you're an organization that's been around for 150 years, you you've been part of the development of the city, and the city in turn mm -hmm. is what it is because of immigrants. No question about that. It's kind of amazing to see what happened from a little group. What happened then, and how it kind of exploded or not exploded exploded is probably a bad word but expanded yeah and how many things developed from that exactly it sort of, it, 
it makes you feel like maybe there is hope for the world or hope for the cities, you know? Yeah. Yeah, I think so. And I, um, it, yeah, as you say, you know, I, used, I always like to say to people, you know, all good things start in church basements. And I, <laughs> yeah, I right. Like exactly start in the basement, but mm -hmm. down the block from the church. And, and, and so clearly that these early Presbyterians soon, you know, realized they were not there to proselytize, they were there to serve. And they still today, I mean, there are a number of Presbyterians on the Erie board, there are people who donate money every year. Um, they have been very faithful uh, to Erie House. Mm -hmm. uh, Maureen, mm -hmm. uh, Leah Axelrod, um, what were the opportunities for volunteers? Did they come from other neighborhoods? Did they come through congregations to uh, work in the programs that were in Erie House? Yeah, I would, they came from the neighborhood itself. Many local residents, you know, might start out ser being served by Erie House. And then as they got on their feet and got more established, they turned around and offered their volunteer services. Mom Savino and her husband and her two kids, there were Savinos all over Erie House all the time <laughs> for, for a good 50 year period. Even yeah. after the, their children moved to the suburbs, they still came back and worked at Erie House, served on the board or volunteered. So the volunteers came um, from many uh, suburban churches, a few churches that Presbyterian Church is still in the city. Remember Edgewater Pres up on, in Edgewater and uh, Buena Memorial, which isn't there anymore, it was torn down. But most of them were from like the church in Wilmette, Winnetka, Glencoe, Highland Park. And they made that trip in. Meals on Wheels went on for 30 years with only wow. church volunteers from these suburban churches. They brought the food, they packaged it up, and they delivered it. And um, I, you know, I came to West Town in 1968 when it was still tough. You know, the gang activity was still there. And never in all the years that those women from Winnetka delivered meals in the neighborhood, never were they accosted, never did they feel unsafe, never were their cars vandalized. Mm -hmm. The word was out in the hood. These are the good folks, you know, and consequently they were able to do it for a long period of time. <clears throat> but yeah, volunteers are, are a key part of Erie House, no question about it. Um, you know, parents would volunteer in the childcare classrooms when they could. Um, a, a lot of adults help, well, all the tutors. So you could come to a, an English class at Erie House and that class was generally taught by a teacher that was partially paid by the city colleges of Chicago. But um, there were also, if they couldn't, you know, some people couldn't fit a class into their work schedule. And mm -hmm. so they would go to Susanna Ortiz, at least for the last 25 years. That's the person I knew, she's been doing it a long time. She ran what's called uh, the Secretary of State SOS um, tutoring program. And um, she was a crackerjack at recruiting volunteers. And she had the volunteers not only working at Erie House, she had them placed in all the local public schools. So if the parents, you know, coming to pick up their kid, they could hang out for, you know, English class or come to a place they were familiar with. Um, so that was, um, that was all volunteers. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I think Maureen. over time, Erie probably has a, a, a paid staff of about 150. Wow. Mm -hmm. Maureen? Yes. Oh, hi, Marianne. Hi. Um, in fact, you just touched on something I was going to ask about. Mm -hmm. Give us a scope, a feeling for Erie House today as mm -hmm. far as the number of, of what are the key programs mm -hmm. and, and the numbers of people that are uh, employees and volunteers. Mm -hmm. Give us a little uh, today's view. Yeah, so um, as I said, there's about 150 people on staff. Now, the two buildings you saw in the photographs, uh, the, the old yellow brick building that has the chapel, you can see the cross on the building, which is where the chapel was. Um, that program, that's the original and it's still operating, mostly adult programs there. Um, English, still English classes, citizenship classes, um, after school program is run there and there's a youth program called Youth, Oper um, youth Options Unlimited for um, uh, seventh through 12th grade. And they come once a week in the evening and they have a volunteer mentor and all the mentors are volunteers. And they um, work with the, um, 
with the kids. Uh, sometimes it's tutoring. Sometimes it's just a conversation with another adult that is not your parent. <laughs> you know, <laughs> teenagers, you know, I'm not going to talk to my dad about this, but uh, another friendly adult. And usually these are young adults in their 20s and 30s. So they still, they relate to the teens pretty well. So that goes on at the house. The other newer looking building you saw that I said is shared by the Erie House and the clinic, that's where the, the preschool program is. So two, three, and four-year-olds, about 185 of them are served there in 10 classrooms. It's a nationally accredited child care program with three um, adults in every classroom, a master teacher, an assistant teacher, and a classroom aide. And a lot of the parents mm. are classroom aides. So they get a job that way, and all you need for that is a high school diploma. Mm. Um, and then there's a, a third location was opened up in 2004 down in, uh, I, I, tell me I'm Chicago and down in, on the southwest side <laughs> of, uh, of Chicago, which uh, was originally called South Lawndale, and now is often referred to as Little Village, La Villita mm -hmm. in, the in the Spanish, in the Mexican community. And uh, we opened a satellite there at the uh, a Catholic, con and a, you know, previously a Catholic convent. Um, which was empty. So we took over the convent and um, we use that to offer programs in Little Village, which is where there are many more Latino immigrants in that location than there are in Erie's original location around the house. Um, Erie, that neighborhood has been uh, pretty much gentrified. You know, um, people came in and well, it started buying the housing in the 80s and 90s, and now it's uh, the income levels um, often make Erie House ineligible for certain programs because of the, if they just look at the demographics of the neighborhood, it's a problem. So that's why they pushed into Little Village to be sure they had a place to relate to the, the income population they were serving. But the reality is Erie House was so well known, people came from distances, you know, they would come to 1347 West Erie, they didn't have to live next door. It was just, you know, the word in the hood was that's where you go. If you want to learn English, you want to get help finding a job, you want to, you know, you want to find a place for your kids, et cetera, et cetera. So those are the three locations, the two big buildings in West Town, and then the operation in Little Village out of the Epiphany Convent. And uh, again, you can see the intertwining of Catholic and Protestant, you know, it just, it's not a distinguished, distinguishable thing. We just, they, uh, these good people all came together to do the work. Yeah. Does that answer your question, Marian? Oh, yeah. and so, if, yeah, if you just go from top to bottom, I mean, the, the main programs today, preschool, as I said, about 185 kids after school for children to come after school, literally, because, you know, their parents aren't home from work yet. So what do they do for those two hours? Get in trouble <laughs> or whatever. So instead, their parents know that their kid is picked up at the school by an Erie staff person and brought to the house or in Little Village to that, that location. And they stay there for the last couple hours till their parents can pick them up. And uh, it's a little education, but a lot of more um, um, play because you know, they've been in school all day already. So um, the idea is to give them a little break and uh, they stay there. And then as I say, the Youth Options Unlimited um, meets every Wednesday evening. That program is 35, 40 years old by now. It's uh, been continually sustained by volunteers from those Presbyterian churches. And now a lot of young people who work downtown who find out about the program, Erie House is not far from the downtown at all. So they come after work spend their couple hours with the teens every Wednesday night from September to June. And um, that's usually about, uh, oh, I think they have maybe 70 youth and their, their mentors. So there's 140 people that pack in every Wednesday nights. I mean, they spread all over the building. <laughs> mm -hmm. And, um, and then the, um, as I said, the clinic, the healthcare, you know, was, was, um, was separated, you know, to the Ham Erie Family Health Center, and we still work very closely together. Almost all the childcare parents who have to get their kids vaccinated before school go to the clinic. You know, why not? Clinics upstairs, childcare's downstairs, one-stop shopping. Um, so, but we don't run that, you know, at all anymore. It's separately incorporated. And then, um, let's see. So English class, citizenship class for adults, and then a, a workforce development program called Pathways to Success, 
which mm. has changed a little bit over the years. I actually started it when I was at Erie in the 90s. And um, we primarily provided um, training uh, in uh, what's called uh, computerized numerical control, CNC, which in fact governs most manufacturing processes. And so we would we had a computer lab, which actually got set up. We were probably one of the first nonprofits to have a community uh, computer lab where people from the neighborhood could come in and use a computer, you know, send photos back to Mexico of the grandkids and, you know, learn how to use Word and all that kind of stuff. We had classes for that. So those computer classes were very popular. And we also have a computer lab in Little Village because um, again, that's a draw. Some come for that and they realize they need to also improve their English. You know, one, either they come first with their kids and then they find out about other programs or they come for the computer lab and then they find out they can, you know, get other things as well. Um, let's see, technology services. Um, I think that's about it. So it's always been a place for whole families, you know, from preschool through adulthood. Yes, so Diane? How has COVID affected all these programs? Well, we were just talking about this before um, the presentation this evening began. Um, uh, clearly, you know, back last year, March, April, Erie House had a shutdown like everybody else in Illinois and you know, many others and all the other states of the United States. Um, they reopened in August um, with certain programs. They had about half the kids show up for childcare, which actually was perfect because they can do social distancing and all that with only half the children there. I think now they're pretty much back up to speed, maybe not entirely yet, but um, they were very fortunate. Um, I was saying before that uh, on March 5th, they had their 150th anniversary gala celebration, raised oh. over $150,000. And oh. five days later, the state shut down. I mean, Raphael Ravello, one of my bosses, used to say, the angels watch over Erie House. And they were working hard that week <laughs> because they got that in just before everything shut down. So um, that was very fortunate. Yeah, they have a fundraiser like that every year, a dinner. And you know, they, usually, they usually bring in around 100,000, which is very good. But somehow that 150 number <laughs> inspired <laughs> people to give and they got up to over 150,000, so. Great. You know, and some of that is still, you know, Presbyterian churches in Winnetka that buy a table at the fundraiser. You know, they just, they don't go away. You know, they're, some, they're on like third generation themselves. You know, their grandparents used to volunteer at Erie. Um, so it still goes on. Uh, so that's, you know, that's pretty much uh, how, you know, and then they did a lot of like all, you know, everybody else, you know, some staff could do work from home, you know, tried to at least keep up with email, let people know what was going on. Um, so, and they have a health, that's the other thing I forgot. They also have a health program that's been uh, not a, not a medical services. That's what the clinic does, but, uh, health education is what Erie does. And so, um, people can, uh, come there and, and uh, they sometimes have a special classes to talk about different health topics. Mostly they're like discussion groups. And, uh, and people come to the a class and then they find out where they can go for services. You know, oh, the mm -hmm. clinic, oh, it's upstairs. Oh, good, you know, <laughs> it takes time. You know, it, it, as every immigrant group, you know, you have to learn what's available, what's safe for you. Uh, you know, can you trust your neighbor? <laughs> mm -hmm. mm. So um, anything else? I was just going to jump in and say how much I appreciated um, not only the sentiments that it's a multi-generational level of involvement, but um, I love that Maureen, you still continue to say, we do this and we do that, that <laughs> you're still so, you know, intertwined within the community and, and it really is, you know, a part of your life still so significantly. And it really speaks to not only the mission of the organization, but the quality of the people that get involved and that it becomes such a, a long-standing family affair. So that's how you know, and, and truly, I'm not the only one. You'll run into a lot of people who you know used to work there, but you know, so how's Erie doing? You know, and how does this program going? And uh, it's a uh, it's a place that grabs your heart, and uh, you know, as of the place and as a way to meet the new immigrants and uh, 
for me to practice my very limited Spanish. But, you know, there was always, you know, where people would encourage you, you know, oh, that's good, you know, yeah, yeah. <laughs> you know? <laughs> but uh, I could be understood mostly, especially if I was controlling the topic. <laughs> but uh, yeah, it was a good place. And uh, yeah, I'm still in touch. The staff, you know, have gradually changed. A lot of people that I, I worked with aren't there anymore, but, um, but there's a few that still are. And uh, so that's good. It's a very special part of the community, which is, is much yeah. needed. So that's well, wonderful. And the, as I said, you know, I, I'm, I'm a great admirer of Jane Addams. I mean, if there was a Jane Addams fan club, I'd volunteer to be president. But, but, <laughs> but that story is told over and over and over. And nobody talks about all the other stories <laughs> that came from that. And that who, as I say, in case of Erie, outlasted even Hull House, you know, and um, that needs to be understood. And, and it's particularly, there's still, I think, eight settlement houses working in Chicago, you know, and that says something about a model. But there are still eight organizations who've been around for more than a hundred years. Mm -hmm. They must be doing something right. <laughs> and, you know, we have all the funding programs that have changed, you know, and how you have to adjust continually and they've managed to do it. And so um, it's, a, it's something that needs to be told. Yes, and I'd like to comment on both your scholarship and activism in connection with Alverno. Mm -hmm. um, I remember the social intellectual history class, which was not about um, kings and queens and presidents and military leaders, but what else was happening that grabbed hold and made a big difference. And you have done that by helping us remember these kinds of leadership and efforts um, that too often you know, get passed over and to document that so well in the midst of your activism with it all, I think it's just a, a really fantastic thing. Thank you. Well, thank you, Linda. And I always say every time I went to the Chicago History Museum to look through the Erie Files, which someone was wise enough to donate there about 20 years ago, um, so that they preserved their historical record um, at the History Museum. And I keep telling them, you know, now that the pandemic is winding down, I said, you know, see those six boxes that I, you know, uncovered at, still at Erie because, you know, it's been a while since they made their last donation. I said, you need to get those over to the History Museum and add them because um, that makes a difference. You have to be good stewards of your own story. Yeah. And they were, and are, well, and hopefully are. <laughs> I'll remind them again. I know exactly where the boxes are. <laughs> <laughs> Which also needed sorting, you know, stuff falls out of file folders and uh, whatever, but Anyway, um, yeah, so it's, it's um, not often you really either get a chance to tell the story of a living institution, you know, while it's still going. And hopefully, you know, 50 years from now, someone will write the 200th anniversary story <laughs> of Erie House, we hope. So, yeah, and again, you know, learned how to be a good writer from the School Sisters of St. Francis. Um, mm -hmm. Remember we had, remember Linda, we had sister uh, Jo, well, now it's Joellen. What was she? Oh, Laurentian was her name. Yes. Fresh yes. English. And I remember her saying, oh, you know how to write. I'm like, duh, you know. <laughs> I, I, I remember starting in fifth grade with, you know, writing compositions because that's <laughs> what the sisters had us do. And, and I say to anytime I can talk to a young person, learn how to write. Yes. You impress other people by yeah. how well you can write because it reflects that you've read, that you can talk about ideas and that impresses. I mean, I can say because I've hired a lot of people over the years. There's nothing like getting, you know, a cover letter that, you know, is poorly written and uh, hopefully not spelling errors and grammar, but I've seen it. <laughs> sure. So, yeah, that's important. Yeah, that's one thing I think the School Sisters of St. Francis really taught us how to spell. Yes, to spell <laughs> and, to, and to write, to really, I mean, I was, you know, we were writing compositions in fifth grade. And I can remember my girlfriends in public schools, they weren't doing any of that. 
you know, I, I, I don't know if other Catholic schools, I assume probably were, but certainly the school sisters were. Mm -hmm. Reading, writing, and music. Yep. <laughs> yes. Yes. I mean, those are the days, you know, in grammar school, we had two full-time musicians. <laughs> so we had classes and we sang in the church choir and, you know, that was just a given. But I know Alverno's keeping the music alive and he'll have some really yeah. excellent programs. So uh, that's good to know. We have the pleasure of having our office close to the chapel and every once in a while we'll hear some students rehearsing and I can't tell you how many times I've just stopped and kind of listened and, you know, it, it gives you the goosebumps to hear, you know, not only the, the beautiful music in the chapel, but also if it's the right time of day, the stained glass is lighting up the pews and it's just such a beautiful, beautiful reminder to just take a minute and appreciate those things. Yeah. I don't remember who said it, but I always remember the quote that when you sing, you pray twice. Mm. I think that's a good message. We, I'm very lucky at the church I belong to now in Chicago, Old St. Pat's. Music is one of their hallmarks. Uh, uh, just really excellent music. Mm -hmm. So, well, um, I don't want to keep you past your dinner hour or whatever you're doing next, but um, it was really so nice of you to join me. I'm, I'm recognizing most of the faces on the <laughs> or the names. Yes, at least. Thank you. Thank you all for joining us and thank you again, Maureen, for, for putting together this lovely presentation and such a beautiful uh, historical overview of, of Erie House and of course the city of Chicago and, and for sharing it with us. We were so excited when you um, had released your book and it's a wonderful way to, to recognize the work that, that uh, Erie House is doing and as well as what our Alverno Strong alums are, are able to do and give back to the community. So. Thank you very, very much. And it was a wonderful presentation. Well, thank, thank you. you. Thank you for hosting thank you. it. Thank you for all of you for joining us. I appreciate it. Uh, hopefully we'll see you around. <laughs>